I'm Steve Sterling, and this is my wife Dottie. We've been doing this for about 20 years, and uh, just love doing it, helping out families and students as well. Um, so today's presentation on financial aid. Um, first thing we're going to do is just have some basic introduction about uh, financial aid, and then we're going to talk about the different types of scholarships. We hear many times that our family makes too much money, we're not eligible for any financial aid. Well, that's completely wrong. If the student has good qualifications in terms of grades and SAT, ACT scores, they're very much uh, eligible for merit-based scholarships. Merit-based scholarships are based on the merit of the student, nothing to do with the financial situation of the, of the family. Um, we then will talk uh, about how, advice on how to maximize your scholarships, get the most out of the scholarships you apply for, and some pitfalls to avoid, and then talk about the final decision process. Some basic introduction uh, and basic advice. Uh, most people cringe at this, because how basic of a question is this? Well, we bring this up because it is a really important situation to many people, because financial aid is scholarships and grants. That's the free money that you do not have to repay, repay or pay taxes on as well. There's federal work study. This is on-campus jobs for students once they arrive. And loans. Financial aid includes loans. So when you hear or read about a college that, that will cover 100% of students' demonstrated need, it might be all loans. So you have to be very careful and read what the offers are. You may have two colleges that you got a lot of money from as a student, and you like them both. You're debating which one to apply for. One may offer 80% of their money might be scholarships and grants, 20% loans. The other one might be 80% loans and 20% scholarships and grants. So you lay out the offers and decide as a family uh, where the student is going to go. Um, so we're going to focus on the free money today. We're not going to talk about loans. That really is a subject uh, as you get nearer to acceptance on May 1st of your senior year to your university that you're going to attend. Some basic advice. Don't assume, as I mentioned previously, that you're not eligible for scholarships. Um, there are many families uh, that we have worked with that make more than $200,000 a year. And because they have multiple kids in school uh, and other situations, they get financial aid that's need-based. Also, there's a merit-based scholarship that I previously mentioned that has nothing to do with the family situation financially, but if you're a strong student and the school really wants you, the way that they get you to come is they offer you money. All right, some other basic advice. So when you, when you evaluate the total cost of the university or college that you're interested in, you need to look at the net price of attending that college, not the sticker price. When you log on, you see that uh, Santa Clara University costs whatever it is today, this year, or next year rather, $65,000 a year. Oh man, we can't afford that. But what happens if they give you $45,000 in scholarship and grants? Then it's cheaper than going to a UC. So don't rule out uh, the expensive private schools. And so you basically want to look at that price and you would subtract the offers of uh, free money to decide as a family what is the most affordable school and uh, the student uh, is interested in attending. And again, uh, for our three kids, we've gone through this process personally three times and helped hundreds of others. Um, all three of our kids went to private schools for less than it cost to go to a public school. They just offered them so much money, it's like kind of a no-brainer. And in a private school, of course, you're in a class of maybe 30, 35. Many times it's less than 15. And if you go to a UC, many times the freshman and sophomore classes are hundreds, as much as 800 to 1,000 students in a class. Some other advice. So you, there are net price calculators on every website for every college. This is where they will estimate that college based on your income and assets, how much they can, you should expect to receive from that school. And it's basically, keep in mind when they, when they tell you about what comes out of a net price calculator as well as the expected family contribution that is calculated from your FAFSA application. That is the amount of money you're eligible to receive. Doesn't mean you're going to get it, but it's how much your student is eligible to receive. 
So you can run through this, and it's, these are pretty fairly accurate. Some are debatable whether they kind of stack the deck to make it look more cheap. But um, these are on every single college website. They will have a net price calculator. All right, so here's some advice. Apply early. Apply for both the need-based, the grants, as well as the merit-based scholarships early. And the reason is that financial aid is given out on a first-come, uh, first first-served basis. So if you wait till the deadline of March 2nd for the FAFSA and send it in so your colleges can receive your money, they may come back to you and say, you know what, you're eligible for all this money, but we already gave it away. We gave it to other students. So we advise our clients to get the FAFSA and uh, also some schools re require the uh, CSS profile application uh, to get it in the first two weeks of October just to make sure that you're ahead of the game. Doesn't mean you're gonna get more money, but you are eligible early. So that's, that's a really important piece of advice. So here's a good example. This happened to us personally. We had a student, we had, and her friend. Our student was our, our client, and the friend, her friend uh, also went to the same high school, and they both valedictorians. So they were both, had perfect GPAs, had outstanding SAT scores, they were heavily involved in extracurricular activities, student government and so forth, and they both were accepted to Santa Clara University. The difference is Kim, our client, applied early action. When you apply early, a deadline of either November 1st or November 15th, it shows the school that you really want to go there. You want to attend. If you wait till the February 1 or whatever that regular decision date is to send in your application, well, the school considered that kind of an afterthought. So the results was that Christy applied regular. The scholarship money awarded, Kim got 145,000 over four years, and Christy got 4,000. So it makes for the student to get all these applications and everything in, uh, in the fall semester very stressful, but then Christmas is fantastic, that vacation, because everything's done and they're waiting to hear. All right, so what types of scholarships and grants are there? I've created, just as we go along and then you wonder where we are, what we're talking about, I've made these posters so you can see the different types of scholarships and grants. So when we refer to one, you can kind of see where we are. So there are need-based scholarships and grants, which are the yellow highlighted, I color coded these. And these are uh, the scholarships that are uh, based on students' family income and assets, family assets. This year, you enter your 2018 tax information, and you also list your current, as of the day you submit different applications, uh, your family's finances, cash, savings, investments, things like that. But again, these are based on family's income, and what's offered is scholarships and grants, when it comes to the merit base, like I mentioned before, merit base is only based on students' qualification, nothing to do with the family's income. Um, there are specific attributes. A lot of times you'll see scholarships available for um, English majors or somebody who's got a, uh, outstanding community service, and they'll stipulate the different attributes that they're looking for on these scholarships. And there's athletic scholarships, we'll touch on that later. And there's also the military or um, ROTC, Reserve Officer Training Corps, um, scholarships. So these are the different types of scholarships. All right, so just talk about each one briefly. The need-based scholarships, this, again, like I mentioned, when you send in your paperwork to calculate what your expected family contribution is, the EFC, that tells you how much your student or you as a family are eligible to receive. Again, not what you will receive. Um, and that emphasizes that. So the perfect EFC after you put it, send in your FAFSA application is zero. You're expected to pay zero because of your family's financial situation. Doesn't mean you're gonna get free college, but it's, it's a really good number. Um, so the financial need is calculated by the total cost of attendance, the COA, minus your expected family contribution, and that's your financial need. So for round numbers, if the cost to attend a university is 50,000, and they calculated that you are expected as a family to pay 15,000, 
then your financial need for that student is 35,000. So the next thing I'd like to address is the best sources of where's the money coming from. These are the type of scholarships and grants. Here's where the, the money comes from. By far the best source are the colleges themselves. They have the ability to give you need-based based on your financial situation, but they also give merit-based, substantial merit-based, and uh, they can give specific attribute or college department scholarships. And some of these look insignificant, but they can actually be pretty significant. Um, when our youngest daughter went to uh, the University of Portland, she uh, researched out after she got accepted and said, hey, dad, there is a department. She was got, uh, her major was communications, and there's a department scholarship. I said, well, apply for it. All right, so the best source, again, are the colleges. Um, and again, this makes colleges, in many instances, more affordable than the public schools. Not always, but in many instances, depending on your students' qualifications, if they have very high GPA and strong SAT, ACT scores, they may get significant money from those schools. Uh, the other source, federal and state governments, as we have here, they only give need-based aid, just based on your FAFSA application, which again, asks for all your income and asset numbers. There's also regional and local scholarships, and these are ones that may be offered by, uh, thank you, for, um, by the Rotary Club or perhaps the parent's employer. Um, these can actually add up to quite a bit. There's also um, the college department scholarships I already mentioned. So once you're accepted, a student is accepted, they should research and at a minimum call the department and always express their enthusiasm for being accepted. They're looking forward to attend. But you'd like to ask if there's any freshman, incoming freshman uh, scholarships for the department. And they can say yes or no, or in our case, like our daughter, they'll send, they send her a two-page form. Um, it's, it's worth the phone call. All right, then there's national scholarships. These are like the FastWeb and scholarship.com scholarships. There are tens of thousands of these. Um, we highly recommend that students only apply to those scholarships that are a perfect fit for them. Because some scholarships that are, are fantastic maybe $20,000 and very significant. But at one major corporation offers a number of these, uh, I think close to 50, but there's 100,000 applicants. The odds of winning are so low on these national scholarships that unless it's a perfect fit, we say you're gonna spend, your daughter, son or daughter is going to be spending all their time writing and, and without any success, most likely. However, uh, we'll talk a little bit later. We, our youngest daughter applied for one scholarship because it was a perfect fit for her in every way. And she brought it to me. I said, yeah, this, this looks like a good one. And she won uh, $8,000. But that was the only one she applied for. And then we also have the um, athletic scholarships and military, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Those are pretty specialized. So let's talk about uh, the campus-based. Real quickly, the campus, this is the institutions themselves, the colleges, they'll offer the need-based, they'll offer the merit-based, they'll offer specific attribute scholarships and departments. And if you're an outstanding athlete, you can perhaps get an athletic scholarships. Most um, athletic scholarships are, are uh, awarded in the future. In other words, as junior, the coaches identify who's gonna get the scholarship. So if you're currently a senior, the likelihood of getting athletic scholarship, the money, is very, very low because they've already given, promised the money to juniors. Uh, however, it is a really nice key to get in the door. It really helps with admission. Um, and then there's the military uh, ROTC scholarships. If you're interested in attending or serving uh, in a, uh, a branch of the military service after you graduate college, uh, you're obligated to four years, but it can be as much as a full ride scholarship for the four years you're at your university. A little bit more about campus. How do you find these scholarships that are being offered by the schools, by the colleges? Basically, when you start researching out the university, how the different steps to apply, you want to go into their financial aid uh, web pages 
and research out what scholarships are, are being offered and document what needs to be done to apply for those scholarships. Um, how to apply, if the need base, what, the only thing that's typically needed is the FAFSA, financial aid application, or the CSS profile, which is a more detailed listing of your financial aid. Um, and sometimes more and more universities are requesting signed copies of your tax returns and they want copies of those. Um, so how to apply um, the merit-based scholarships um, I have, may have additional applications, but most of them, the colleges, thank heaven, say uh, all students are automatically considered for merit-based. That's, but you still need to dig in and look at the big dollar ones. Some of these universities will say this, and then you kind of go into the president's scholarships or the provost scholarship, and lo and behold, there's an extra application. So that's good when it says this, but there may be a few high dollar ones that you do need extra applications. So you need to research that. And of course, um, then attributes, the, if, you, if you go in and there may be specific uh, extra scholarships available based on ethnicity, nationality, based on your major, based on whether you're male or female. It's just, uh, there may be all kinds of them listed and you have to go in and dig, it, dig through it and then document what needs to be done to apply for those. And then department scholarships we've already discussed, contact them after you're accepted. And athletic scholarships, again, mostly awarded as juniors. They identify, it's unbelievable to me that some major universities are identifying basketball players like in the eighth grade and promising things and getting, trying to get the kid to get a verbal commitment, which isn't binding, but they're doing that. And so the military ROTC scholarships have uh, additional applications altogether. But if you're interested in serving the military, these are really good ones, but they are highly competitive. All right. So the federal and grant, federal and state governments, they only give need-based scholarships. And the only thing to apply for is the FAFSA that becomes available October 1. And um, it, each school has a different deadline. If you look at the state schools in California, uh, March 2nd is the deadline, but schools have different deadlines. Some of them require these by November 15th. So you have to pay attention and say, oh, I've, I've got till March, I'll finish this in January. Miss the deadline. Each school has its own deadline. So to do the research, to gather all this, to actually do everything is quite an effort. Um, and we'll talk a little bit in our next session about applying to college. We highly recommend that, that parents assist with doing what I, what I like to call the tedious, necessary tasks. Doing research, finding out what the FAFSA, which the parent has to complete because it talks about their tax returns and bank accounts and everything else. Um, the need-based uh, need aid is also requires in California a simple half-page GPA verification form if you're going to get Cal grants. So need-based is just FAFSA profile and then the GPA verification. The regional scholarships, again, they, this is mostly awarded based on uh, community service, sometimes financial need. But again, each scholarship will outline what they're looking for and what the requirements are. Um, typically sponsors include community organizations like, like Dottie had mentioned. And how to apply, you need to watch for announcements from the uh, school bulletin or talk to your high school counselor. And we really highly recommend to apply for all of those local regional scholarships because like Dottie explained, you know, you never know, you might just hit a number of them and it adds up to a lot of money. And the college departments, we've talked about this, call in and see what is available. They may say there's none, but if there is, definitely apply because the number of applicants for these are so small because nobody really thinks about looking online and looking for the department scholarships as an incoming freshman, you're just trying to get in. And so this can turn out to be significant money and the applicant pool is so small, you have a pretty good chance. All right, then the national scholarships, again, we recommend that students go on and do a search using fastweb.com or scholarship.com, but only apply for those scholarships that meet the student's uh, specific 
very exact qualifications. When they're open, national scholarships are usually a waste of time because there's just tens of thousands of applicants for some of them. And sometimes they'll post the winning uh, essays, and you read them, and you go, a high school student really wrote this? So anyway, still worth registering for, because there might be that one, like our daughter, that was worth applying for. OK, athletic scholarships, um, again, you got to need to work with the coaches here in high school, as well as contact the college coaches. I think the most interesting aspects are that if you do get an athletic scholarship, you are committed to play. So if you don't play, you're going to lose it. Uh, but the, an interesting one is this last bullet here, is sometimes schools are starting new programs, such as a crew, the rowing program. We've had uh, clients get a substantial scholarship for crew, and they've never been in a boat. But they were outstanding st soccer athletes. This one girl was tall, she was strong, and she, when she visited on campus, they identified that, so they offered her money for a sport that she'd never played. And they may have, you know, they may offer something to a, a female in particular for lacrosse, or some of these other um, unusual or less popular sports. All right. And so um, the athletics, again, work with the college coach and the high school coach to see. At this point, for seniors, uh, this is a really good avenue to go to get in, but you probably, for acceptance, but you probably will not get any money. But it doesn't mean if you're an outstanding athlete and make the team as a sophomore, you couldn't get athletic scholarships. But incoming at this point is pretty, pretty unlikely. And the military ones are um, the academies, a, a little bit too late for seniors. But for juniors and some of the younger students, uh, you can, the application for the academies really begins in April of your junior year, because you've got to request recommendations from congressmen and senators and so forth. It's a pretty lengthy process. Um, but there's also the ROTC scholarships, which are uh, due in December and January. And they're very competitive scholarships because they're full ride. And the academies are regarded academically as the, some of the top schools in the country. All right, so you are obligated to four years of service afterwards, but you leave college zero, zero in debt. All right, so this is available on the back. This is uh, all these different types of scholarships and when to apply. We've kind of listed them out on uh, the different types of scholarships, how to apply, when to apply, and who's eligible, and how much you can actually be awarded. So that's in the back for everybody. We've also got a process um, flow chart, starting at the top, do you need financial aid and no one yes and it breaks it all down and it provides dates and wh where to apply or when to apply. Just kind of make it. Some basic advice for maximizing your scholarship and grant awards that you're applying for. Um, so for students, obviously for the merit-based scholarships which are really significant, um, you got to get top grades because the top grades are the ones that are going to get the most money. Colleges will have, they have a table, so to speak, that for the amount of money that they can award merit-based, they have GPA and SAT, ACT scores. And based on how high those are, you're eligible maybe for the top tier of $25,000 a year just for merit. And if you're 3.5 and medium SAT scores, maybe you're only available for like 5,000 a year. So both for money, the grades and the SAT, ACT scores really matter. So that's the one thing students should strive for. Another really important factor is uh, reduce the money held in the student's name. So the standard formulas uh, use about 20% of students' money each year. Let's say they have a savings account of $10,000. They look at 20% of that being used to pay for their education before they're eligible to receive financial aid from the state and federal governments. So it's 20% every year. So that's 80% is what they're looking for. Where the money it's held in the, in the parent's name, they only expect 5.6% of that to be used. So it's a di huge disadvantage to have money held in the student's name. So a 529 education plan is considered a parent asset. They changed that a number of years ago because 
if a grandparent or a parent had 50,000 in a 529 and it was a student asset, they lowered their financial aid awards way down and everybody argued, well, this isn't the students, the parents or the grandparents built this over years. So now it's considered a parent asset. So reduce the money in the student's name. Um, so you should also be aware, they look at your current uh, assets, financial assets. So for this year, they're looking at, you will list how much you have investments in cash and checking and saving as of the day you submit the application. So they also ask for your 2018 tax returns. There's nothing you can do about that. But the current cash is as of the day you submit the application. So it's, it is an advantage to look financially needy as possible on paper. All right, it's good to look needy on paper. Um, you should again submit early the FAFSA and CSF profile applications. These are multiple page applications asking, especially the profile, it asks for everything imaginable. Because in the past, people had offshore accounts and all this weird type of thing, and they nail it down so to avoid people that aren't being honest. And sometimes you've got to return your federal tax returns. <laughs> apply as, basically as early as you can for financial aid, and apply for the campus space, everything that you're eligible for, national scholarships, only those that are truly your, um, meet your qualifications to the letter, and apply for all the local scholarships. Some advice, basically research uh, you're eligible to apply for. Parents, if you can assist, there's a lot to do. Your student has to apply for admission and now they've got to do scholarship applications. If you can print out the scholarship applications and even with a pencil put in the necessary information, the name of the counselor, the counselor's phone number, anything like that, that'll save your student time because they have to write an essay. They have to prep for the interview. So anything you can do to save them time um, by doing that kind of uh, the tedious necessary work. Um, and of course, the students got to write the essay, talk to the teachers for recommendations and interviews. All right, what are the winning scholarship criteria? So each scholarship has its own criteria and you need to learn what that is. Typically it's in the rules section of the scholarship and you need to tailor your scholarship for what they're looking in their scholarship uh, winners. And so sometimes they may be, uh, they're looking for, like in our example, a senior who plays golf and has good grades, but there may also be a stipulation in there, there's gotta be financial need. Sometimes they don't have that, sometimes they do. Um, so they, the, those scholarship applications that are successful are the ones where the scholarship committee, the deciders on who wins, really know the student who's applying. All the different um, parts of the application should work together to paint a really vivid picture of the student. So if it's, for example, community service, the application has to indicate that they're strong in their community service. When they ask for a letter of recommendation, you should have a cover letter and say, dear teacher so-and-so, please, I'm asking for a letter of recommendation, would you please mention A, B, and C? Then the essay should talk about, well, I, my love for community service, I volunteered here, I volunteered there. So every piece kind of dovetails together. So the person reading the scholarship application will go, yeah, I really know this kid. And they're really dedicated, Let, let's pick them. Um, so, so again, let the judges know who you are Present yourself as an excellent representative of their organization. Be an upstanding citizen um, and a deserving recipient. So if, for example, a student um, has volunteered, they want to go into biology maybe as a major in college because they want to be pre-med, and they have volunteered the last year at the hospital as a student volunteer, and they've filed papers, they've also delivered meals to uh, patients, some of the patients are elderly, so forth, when they apply for community service, they should stress how great it is, what a great feeling it is to help other people and help the hospital and help the patients. When there's a scholarship for helping senior citizens, the same information needs to be presented as I enjoy helping elderly. In particular, one day I, I served dinner to Mr. Smith and I sat with him for 10 minutes to discuss um, what he used to do before he retired. 
And so you want to tailor that information for what they're looking for. You can have the same event, same volunteer service, but you can put it toward what they're looking for. And that's what you really need to do. And you're right to captivate leaders, readers rather. <laughs> okay, fine. there's some pitfalls to avoid. Number one, saving money in the student's name. This is one we've already gone over. Um, so you'd rather have that cash or that money that's saved for student education be in the hands of the parent because that is looked at about 5.6% of the available financial assets come from parents, where if it's in the student name, they're gonna take it all. Um, and kind of a keynote is anybody who's not in the immediate family, uncles and aunts and grandparents, they're not expected to pay any percentage. All right. All right, so here's a very good, important fact that if you receive money, and every school will say this in their website or in their bulletin, you must report any uh, scholarship money that is received from outside sources. So that's like you win $5,000 from the Rotary Club or the grandparent gives the student $10,000 in cash. You must report that to the school, the college. So the results could be, in most cases, this is what would happen in that situation. It's a zero balance. And you'll see what I mean in a minute. It is not acceptable to do this at all. So by winning $5,000 from the Rotary Club, you could actually lose money. And I'll show you how. So what it does is it lowers the offer of money from the school during the freshman year. And the freshman year is what's called the financial aid baseline. You want to get the most money you can as a freshman because sophomore, based on your income as a family increase or decrease, the money goes up or down from that baseline of money. So another keynote is students making more than, this is last year's figures, um, $6,570 per year. That's take home pay. So they could actually make more because they're going to be taxed and so forth. If they make more than this, that's considered a renewable source of income, and the financial aid from schools and the government will go down. So what the bottom line for the federal and state financial aid for this figure, every dollar above 65.70, for every dollar they, they, a student earns, they reduce the financial aid from the government by 50 cents. So they're working for half pay. All right, so that's a key number to know. So here's an example of more could mean less because you've won the Rotary Scholarship for 5,000. So let's say a, a university gives a student $20,000 uh, from the campus, from the institution themselves. And so they're considering this is a maximum that the school's gonna award that student. And so let's say they've won $5,000 from Rotary Club. What will happen is the school offered them $20,000 here, but the student got 5,000 from Rotary Club. So what the school will do, not all schools, but many schools, is they will reduce their 20 to 15,000 and replace that with the money made from Rotary. So it's still $20,000. So you, you basically lost time and effort because it's the same amount of money, but it's a zero. Well, here's what happens is the sophomore, junior, and senior year, the school doesn't go back up to 20,000, they leave it at 15. The one-time award from the Rotary Club of 5,000 disappears after freshman year. So instead of getting, accepting the original award without any Rotary money, that student meeting the qualifications every year would get 20, 20, 20, 20. In this case where they won $5,000 from the Rotary, this, most schools, will give this zero sum game, so they will get 20, 15, 15, and 15. So our own daughter won um, a scholarship like this, and this is when in our early days, 20 years ago when we were learning, and it just killed me because we had to turn down a significant scholarship because this was gonna happen. I call, I call I'm calling for my daughter, doesn't want the scholarship. What? Don't want it. And then I got the financial aid uh, administrator, one of the, the, the dean, dean, the head of the financial aid, and explains, she goes, ooh, that's a smart move. 
Yeah, unfortunately, my daughter spent weekends preparing this application and everything, but it is what it is. So also not appearing to be a worthy um, uh, recipient is a, uh, uh, a big pitfall. Um, they need to really demonstrate that they're, they uh, are on board with the mission of the scholarship, like serving community, serving the elderly, like I said. Um, and you need to, again, application needs to really show who the student is. Um, learn a much, as much, if you go to interview, you need to learn as much as you can about the scholarship. So when you're in front of the committee, you're all, you know what their mission is, you know what their goals are, you know how, if you win the money, how you can contribute by continuing to be involved in community service. Um, so just be informed as possible and be mature and enthusiastic in front of that uh, inter, uh, interview panel. There are scams, you guys have probably all heard of these. This, if they require any scholarship requires a payment of money or any guarantee, if you apply, you definitely will win some money. Um, if they request personal information, um, or if you receive that you've won a scholarship and you never even applied, they're after your information and or your money. And so, or there's no valid contract. If you win, there's gonna be documents to sign. Um, and if there's no, nothing to do, oh, you've won, here we're gonna send you your money, give us your bank account. Don't go there. Okay, so one of the other pitfalls is the failure to plan ahead. You guys are all here, so you're planning ahead. You got to really uh, meet the deadlines that are necessary. I'm sad to say um, we were asked this a lot. Is there advantage to not applying for financial aid? And the answer is yes. They want you to come in and write a check for 65,000. And there's many international students that do that. Um, so, uh, but if you need money, you got to apply. I mean, it's the way it goes. There are the students that pay full, full boat to universities do have an advantage. But if you need money, you have to apply, so do so. The final decision process, basically, how do you know how much is offered through this whole thing? This is the, the only part that's easy. What will happen is every university that your student has been accepted to will send you a financial aid award letter. Usually it's an email, but some still send nicely embossed letters outlining all the money. And so you'll see, receive a letter and it'll outline all the different aid that's being offered. And here's just an example where this is the format that's used. Here for this student, a fictitious student, the gift aid, meaning uh, scholarships and grants, gift aid is free money. The self-help aid are loans. And they'll break out how much they're giving you each semester or quarter and they come down to the bottom line how much you're being offered. And then a lot of times they will have a next line that says, based on this number, you have to come up with an additional $3,000 or something. So, but every school will send you this. So as a family, you lay out all the different offers and talk about, well, this, this is the top choice for your student, but they didn't offer any money. The next choice the student really wants to go to, the second choice school, maybe they're offering 40,000 a year. Who knows? And as a family, you have to decide What's the best school for them to attend? Okay, so, so once, what you need to do, like I said, is you get these financial aid award letters and you lay them out for comparison. And again, you look how much money is being offered as free money, scholarship and grants, and how much is being offered as loans. Um, so you need to make sure another thing is that the awards are good for all four years. These are called renewable scholarships and grants. A lot of times the UCs will offer a decent sized scholarship, but it's only good for freshman year. So you have to find out and make very much sure that your awards to your student is good for all four years. Um, compare the offers and as a family, uh, you need to make that decision. Also be aware of the requirements to keep the scholarship. There's uh, been uh, stories about universities that give really great merit-based scholarships the freshman year, but to keep those, the students need like a 3.7 GPA, and they know statistically they've run numbers and they said, okay, 40% of the, of the freshmen are not going to meet that. So the money that they won't get sophomore, junior, or senior year, we can offer to the next incoming freshman. And 
your student, if this happens to them, they're going to say, oh, I've already been here a year. I love the school. So most parents will get out the checkbook and start filling that out. So if it requires a 3.7 GPA to keep that scholarship, mm, it's going to be tough. You hate to lose that. Um, sometimes with the magic words I look for are the student, in order to keep the money, the student needs to maintain uh, satisfactory academic progress. That means 12 units and, you like, and in their various fashions about a 2.0 GPA. And then the, the student can enjoy college because they're not stressing, oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lose my scholarship. I've only got a B in my physics class or whatever it might be. A 2.0 is pretty, pretty good. Scholar, uh, GPA to maintain, pretty easy, that's not fair to say, but doable. But a 3.7 is very challenging. Um, and so you need to find out what those requirements are, typically 12 units. Okay, negotiations, real quickly to end up, there are three situations where um, you can negotiate or appeal the financial aid offers that your student is provided. Um, this, tough, this first one is really very tough. The best offer, oh no, excuse me, this is, this is the best one. The best offer is not from your top choice school. So one of the reasons you apply to multiple schools is you're going to get different financial aid award letters. So if your student really is in love with some university, but they offer much lower than another university, the parent, we recommend, if they're going to call, go call and say, your university, it, this is a top university that's not offering as much money. My son or daughter really wants to come to your school. Uh, but there's another university that's offered significantly more money. Is there anything you can do to help my son or daughter? And they will undoubtedly ask to see that letter, so have it already scanned in on the computer. And they may say, no, we don't negotiate awards. But we've had several clients uh, get increases in aid anywhere from $1,000 to $5,000 per year just by one phone call. So it's worth doing, but you've got to be very diplomatic, not argumentative. Just what can you do for me? Um, the second one is change in family uh, finances. Uh, by the time you apply an award, somebody in the family, uh, husband or mom or dad, loses their job. That's worth calling the financial aid office and say, listen, next year our income is going to be way down. Just lost my job. And then it's up to the school. They can say, OK, we're going to help you out or say sorry. But it's worth calling for. And this is the last one that's really hard. If, if you know of another student that has very similar qualifications as your student, but they got more money than you. I don't know how you find that out. That does work to um, uh, appeal the, your student's award. Verbal appeals, we, we really recommend the families call, make the phone call because the student is either so in love with the university that they have stars in their eyes and they really uh, don't know how to negotiate. And the parents, it's totally acceptable for the parent to call and ask about the money because you're the one paying the majority of the money. Um, and again, express concern, not aggression. Um, and what can you do for my son or daughter? If there's a written appeal, then it most effectively comes from the student. And of course, the parent would want to look at that email to the financial aid administrator from the student to make sure everything's good. And finally, which college should attend? You want to look at all your information discuss things with your parent and kind of go with your gut feeling. You know, I just got a feeling this is my best school and decide which is most affordable and as a family decide. And it's a separate process, just mainly clicking a box on a website to accept your financial aid awards. So yeah, that's a separate thing you, you must do. And then of course, the drop dead deadline of May 1st is the day you have to accept enrollment at a school. So senior year, before, right before graduation, that May 1st is a drop dead deadline to accept enrollment. And summary, uh, long and involved effort to complete the different scholarships and financial aid applications. Parents and students, we advise, really need to work together um, to come up with this. Students, keep up with your, your grades. Uh, some students have um, said during meetings with, with with their parents and us, they said, well, I'm going to be accepted to my university before the fall grades come out, which is true. Before they're posted, they can get accepted. But the financial aid awards don't really become final until March and April. So every university looks at the fall grades. 
And if you've gone from 4.0 student to B and C's because you say, hey, I don't have to worry about it anymore, you will get zero money. So the senior year, fall grades do matter.